We've all seen those futuristic movies where robots scan us for our vital signs and can fix our injuries and even care for us when we get older. But the thing is, this isn't the stop of science fiction anymore. This is increasingly becoming our reality. So how can robotics and AI improve our healthcare? And to what extent would we be willing to let machine technology be a part of the way we're looked after? I'm a Fran Scott, presenter, maker, and all around engineering fan. In this episode of the Robot Podcast from ABB, we're looking into robotic innovation in healthcare. We'll be hearing from Bill McKeon, President and CEO of Texas Medical Center, a facility that utilizes robotics extensively in its day-to-day -day work, and its scale is just enormous. We'll also hear about the remarkable work of Professor Mark Field, a heart surgeon whose use of a new robotic system is providing improved outcomes for both him and his patients. But before that, let's get an overview of robotics in medicine and why it's so important. It's certainly something that ABB's Global Business Development Officer, Robin Cardwell, is passionate about. I believe that we can treat patients better and we can improve healthcare for the human species, I guess, from many different angles. I don't think you need to be a doctor to do that. And so when I started my career, I went the route of biomedical engineering, of how we can use engineering and technology to help improve patient care. Working from healthcare from different angles, not only the doctors and scientists, but also from the engineering and technology perspective and the intersection of that can really drive innovation. That is quite incredible. Basically, you are passionate about it because you want to improve the planet for humans. <laughs> and this is the way that you do it. I think we are learning that it's not just a one discipline endeavor. It's a multidiscipline, cross-functional, let's pull our collective knowledge to bring new treatments and new innovations to the healthcare space. So have you personally used robotics and automation within a healthcare setting? Yes. After my PhD in biomedical engineering, which focused on a field called regenerative medicine, I actually worked in a number of diagnostic labs where we were taking a test, an assay, if you will, that had been discovered to help identify patients that maybe have a specific type of cancer. And my job in these roles was to use automation to scale up this innovative test from maybe 10 samples a day to thousands of samples a day. And using that, we could really improve both the quality of the test, but also allow our operators that were running the test to run more samples at a time using automation rather than having them pipette thousands of samples a day. And therefore, we had more patients that were able to benefit from these genomic tests and could help the doctors diagnose the specific types of cancers that they had. And when it comes to robotics and automation in terms of diagnostic tools, are they used anywhere else? There's many places it's used. Hospitals, for example, you can have a robot taking, I don't know, samples or medications from one floor of the hospital up to maybe the 10th floor. So we don't have to have a nurse running around and getting all our steps in for the day. You can have robots transporting. You can have robots selecting patients and building orders out of a shelf, for instance, robots assisting nurses. Even there's there are robots in the surgical suites as well. Are we at the point yet where we could have, say, an hospital operating system where we could have the robots sorting and delivering the medication directly to the patients? Absolutely. I think that that is in place already in multiple places around the world. And I think it can get better. We are at a point where hospitals are looking for that innovation and how can they improve the life of their workers as well as the patients. And robotics can really help delivering those medications, assisting in day-to-day -day operations and really making care better for everyone. So Robin, how much are the robots in contact with the patients? How much do the patients see or is it all happening behind the scenes? It depends on the hospital and it depends on the application. I know that's a vague answer, but robots can be behind the scenes and processing samples, but robots can also be right next to a nurse 
who's maybe taking blood from a patient, it's assisting the nurse perhaps in that procedure, or a robot can work in a surgical suite where the patient would never see the robot, but they could be helping the surgeons and perhaps videotaping the surgery or helping them in performing the surgery themselves. So it depends, I think, a lot on the application. I think there's an endless number of possibilities. When it comes to your role, I believe it's all about building a bridge between technology and the people that are in healthcare. And so how do you go about doing that? Because people in healthcare are busy, right? Absolutely. We're a technology company and we build really great robots, but we haven't spent years tuning our trade and caring for patients and working in a hospital system. So we really rely on that partnership and collaboration with our healthcare workers, our lab technicians, to tell us what is challenging them every day and where they might be able to use robotics. So we really look at this as listening to our customers and listening to these folks on what's their day-to-day like. We can only see a snippet of it, but it's really important that we listen to them and provide a technology solution that can really help their day-to-day. Robin, I'm really intrigued about what the response has been in the hospitals, both from those working in the hospital and, of course, as well from the patients. How has the use of robotics and automation, how has it been received? It's mixed. There can be skepticism at all levels because these scientists have worked in the lab and they know very well their trade and what they're doing. And how can a robot replace me when I've been doing this? And it's important to point out that robots aren't replacing any of this. Robots are only as smart as the person that actually designed the test or the system or things, but they can do it in a way over and over again without breaks that maybe improves the test that was originally designed or really helps improve an experience for whether the operator or the patient. So I think it can be quite varied. Hospitals are changing, we all know that, but in terms of the hospital of the future... What might that look like from your perspective? It's a great question. Hospitals of the future is somewhat of a buzzword, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So they need strong advocates. One of the areas I've seen is is like at the Texas Medical Center in Houston. They're one such hospital that's really open to this idea of innovation and introducing new technologies that might be able to improve the healthcare for everyone. Advocates for those challenges that may be there, advocates that allow the innovation to happen and to try out some things to see how it works. I really hope to see what we call a lights off laboratory or lights off hospital where we have robots that can work around the clock so we can shorten these times where we need to get an answer in order to inform how we treat a patient. We can have robots that are working flexibly So they may not do the same task every day, but they may be pipetting one day and the next day they're assisting a nurse. I think we're close to that in robotics where we can have robotics be more flexible and be able to work around the clock. They don't really need breaks and really just using the technology that we have, you know, whether that's AI and machine learning to help inform what the robot's doing advanced materials so that we can handle challenging samples. I think we're going to see more and more robots uh, working hand in hand over the coming years. I totally agree. Robin Cardwell, ABB's Global Business Development Officer. Now, imagine just one place that can treat more than 10 million patients a year. A place that has grown in size with several new groundbreaking campuses designed to help early stage technologies. Here you'll also find a business accelerator that gives companies all around the world the chance to be supported and become successful with a $50 million venture fund thrown in to invest in their work. Seems too good to be true, right? Well, welcome to the Texas Medical Center, a place where robotics is having a significant positive impact on the health of its patients. Bill McKeon is president and CEO of the center and has been telling me about another exciting project they have. The new campus, referred to as TMC Helix Park, is another 27-acre campus that's designed for translational research. 
And for the first time, this allows industry to sit side by side by our leading institutions and conduct innovative research. Another campus is called TMC Bioport, and that is designed for biomedical manufacturing. Now with cell and gene therapy being really an important part of our manufacturing and care process, we need to have those capabilities near to all of our campuses. Now why that's important for innovation and specifically robotics is anything that you need to get exposed to in healthcare is here on this campus. We have the largest number of surgeries performed on this campus. We have the largest number of patients that are treated on this campus. We have the largest number of clinical trials on this campus. So if you really think of a Petri dish for innovation and speed and efficiency, and that's why this specifically designed for that intent is moved from discovery to commercialization faster than any other place in the world. Bill, could you give us any specific examples of where robotics are being used and automations being used in an innovative way within some of these startups? Right next door to where my office is, is Baylor Pathology Department. Now, remember, Baylor and Texas Children's is the largest children's hospital in the world. So imagine just the samples, whether it be blood samples, urine samples, test samples that move through a place that treats 10 million patients a year. Think about the volume coming from all of our hospitals. I mean, there's 28 hospitals within walking distance. So if you can think of the sheer magnitude of what a pathology department faces day in and day out, When a sample comes through, we have to make sure it's yours, so we have to timestamp it. We have to be absolutely, we're testing your sample and not someone else's, so you have to validate it. You have to open that. You have to use a pipette to actually take the sample out, put it on a dish, and then you have to process and analyze that. That is a very laborious task, arduous at best, for any person. Robots are perfect at this because robots never sleep. They're very efficient. The Yumi robot we're using with ABB has cameras on both of its wrists, so it takes a picture of it before it picks it up. It picks it up, takes another picture of it, t- processes it, places it on it, time stamps it, understands all of it, and it does it 50% faster than any human can do it. When often people think about robots, they think of them as, oh my goodness, robots are taking over jobs. Not at all. They're just accentuating the jobs here. We want our people using their minds, not repetitive actions, that a robot can do so much better than a human. So that's just one example. We move our supplies through the hospital. We have drugs that are on the floors and need to come back into the department. Well, today, humans have to look at that and open the vial and say, okay, here's a person that had painkillers that didn't use them, so they came back and we have to put them into our warehouse. Well, that's done by humans. Robots are so much better at doing that. Did you say there's 28 hospitals on the campus within walking distance? You could take all of the hospitals probably from Manchester down to London and put them all together on one campus We treat more patients than the entire population of Scotland, than the entire population of Denmark. We've been here for 70 years, and we're still growing 10 to 15% a year. Could you tell us a bit about how what you're doing has then led to something that has helped the patients? Not too far from our memory, we were the data center for the entire COVID pandemic here. And for over three years... We processed the information. We've done our own testing on this campus. So we knew in real time what viruses were here. We knew what percentage of our population had COVID. We knew how they were responding to therapies because all of our CEOs met every morning at 7 a.m. And we processed the data from twice a day. So in real time, where other states Other countries didn't really know this for five or six weeks. And that's a multiple week proposition. We never had that. We were doing it two times a day. And so robots being able to go through samples and analyze them with speed 50 times faster was hugely helpful to us and continues to be in the way we analyze data across the entire medical center. I can't imagine anyone that is so well placed within 
the innovation and the up and coming innovations within healthcare to answer this next question in terms of what is your vision for the future potential of robotics within healthcare, given sort of where we are today, what is up and coming? Share you with you a little bit of secret because not many people go into research labs throughout the world, and I've been in many. You'd be surprised how lack of technology there is, not on the microscopes, not in the minds of the scientists around the world, but the process. So if I was a running a lab and you were a part of my team, you would basically take your samples and let's say they're tissue samples or cell samples and you'd do your work and then you'd pick up your equipment and you'd walk down the hall to about 30 freezers and open up and they all look silver, slide my samples into a refrigerator. Anyone in that lab or the 50 labs that sit next to you can do the same thing. There's no automation, there's no security. So imagine you're four years into your research. You've been studying a very specific cell line that you believe could be the next cure for a cancer. And someone else mistakenly goes in and grabs your samples and puts them back somewhere else. But when you think about your life's work and cutting research, then robots in the future, and we're already working with that, are going to take your samples right from your desk. They're going to bring them into the lab. It will have a secure only, no human entry into your freezers. It will place it in location 41604. And when you come back and swipe your card, it will return to you and go get your samples and bring them back to you. Now, that seems like a very simple thing, but I'm telling you, it's been problematic throughout labs throughout the world forever. Bill McKeon, President and CEO of the Texas Medical Center. And what an amazing place that is. Like, just imagine the innovation going on there. I'm someone who has worked on stem cells many moons ago, and I personally was frustrated by the lack of automation within a biomedical lab. So to hear that now they're becoming more and more automated is just music to my ears and I, I look forward to what is next. In a study published by the international medical journal JAMA, it was found that robotic surgery reduced the chance of readmission by more than 50% and it revealed a striking fourfold 77% reduction in blood clots when compared to patients who had open surgery, blood clots being a significant cause of health decline and death. Patients' physical activity, stamina and quality of life also increased. So with statistics like this, I think we can all agree that it makes sense that robotics is going to be playing an ever-increasing role within healthcare. But how specifically can robotics and AI be seen to be working right now to save lives and give better outcomes for patients? Well, we are off to a UK hospital where a new device is helping medical practitioners do some pretty amazing things. Professor Mark Field is a heart surgeon at the Liverpool Chest and Heart Hospital, and he explains how his team is being supported by the use of robotic technology and AI. Myself and my team are interested in diseases of the aorta, which is the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart. The most common thing that we deal with with this blood vessel is that it forms aneurysms, and aneurysms are swellings of the aorta and those vessels when they get too big over a certain size then they're at risk of rupture and so the difficulty comes is how do you replace a bit of your aorta and the branches that go up to the brain while preserving the brain and while preserving the blood flow to the rest of the body they're quite large operations essentially it involves a cut through the breastbone and exposing the heart and then we use the heart-lung machine to take over the function or the blood flow of the body. And the only way we can protect the brain while interrupting the blood supply to it is to cool the body down. Essentially, we put the patient onto the heart-lung machine, we put some pipes into the heart, the heart-lung machine cools the body down. So normally your temperature is about 37 degrees, and the heart-lung machine will cool your body down to about 22 degrees. And then at a certain point, we 
turn the circulation off completely. So at this point, the heart isn't working, the lungs are not working, uh, there is no flow to the body, and there is no flow to the brain. At that point, the patient is effectively dead for that time because really nothing is working. The only thing preserving them is the temperature. And at that point, we cut away the aneurysm and then we re proceed to replace it with prefabricated sort of grafts. It really is fascinating to me, and I've been doing it for a long time, is that you can put little cannulas up the carotid arteries and you can perfuse blood to the brain. So you're supplementing blood to the brain at a much lower flow than normal, and that will just keep it oxygenated. Um, but then you can also flow backwards through the brain. We can put cannulas into the veins of the brain. And this comes to the heart of the matter. Although we're heart surgeons operating the aorta, we're more interested in, in the brain and how to protect the brain because that's obviously key to the outcome because the operation comes with some risk. So when it comes to a procedure like this, obviously it's not easy but what are the main challenges for you yes it's very specific the problem what flow do we need to supplement the brain with through these small cannulas to appropriately protect the brain traditionally we've been told from studies many decades ago that we should flow roughly around a liter per minute up to the brain but one of the big problems with these patients is delirium and the other one is stroke the stroke risk is mostly related to sticking little cannulas up the carotid arteries because you can imagine by the nature of the fact they're having an operation they have diseased arteries so if you stick a cannula up there you may dislodge a little bit of crud or a little bit of something and that goes up to the brain and causes a stroke and the other issue is if you're flowing to the brain too much then you may cause it to swell and then the swelling can cause a temporary injury which manifests itself as, as delirium or confusion and they spend a lot of time on intensive care. So essentially we have treated the brain as a sort of black box and we just flow up into it forward or we flow backwards through it and then we measure a little bit of oxygen saturation at the front and then essentially hope for the best. It's not very patient specific, it's not adjusted according to gender or to size. There's been a lack of science. And what this technology has done, uh, transcranial Doppler, has introduced some science into that and the robotic aspects of that instrument. Mark, this is absolutely fascinating. My, my jaw is wide open. And in terms of the nitty gritty, how, how does this system work? Could you paint a picture for me? This Doppler, you put a probe in around the temples, just behind the eyes, you can measure blood flow or blood velocity in what's called the middle cerebral artery. This Doppler technology has been around for some time, actually, but what it required was a vascular technician, so someone specialised in, in measuring vascular blood flow, to sort of ferret around underneath the operating sheets and put a handheld probe to the temple of a patient and then try to adjust that with his hand and try to get a measurement. And then you can imagine going to the other side of the brain and then there are issues around reproducibility. And, and so essentially, I think this technology was trialled a few decades ago and didn't really go anywhere. So this new company have produced a robotic transcranial Doppler and essentially is two pods that sit either side of the head. So the patient's asleep, they're lying on their back and they're on a ventilator. So the head is in a cradle, keep it still. And then attached to that cradle are these two sort of pods, which are about the size of an orange or something like that on either side. They basically sit there and they measure the blood flow into the brain. And so, first of all, they acquire the signal. So you put two little sort of markers on the temple where you think the middle cerebral artery is. It, one of the monitoring screens that you have is a real-time picture of the patient's head and you can see it picking up the markers that we've put on the side, and you can see it localizing and acquiring that signal. And then you can ask it to point in different directions and look at different arteries, which it will do. And then throughout the case, it will reacquire that signal. Absolutely amazing, Mark. So obviously it allows you to look at the blood velocity and so through that the blood flow in much more detail than you have done before and so brain oxygenation. And by having more precise figures on that, what improvement does that lead to not only the procedure but to the patient themselves overall? 
you've nailed the question right there. Initially, what we found was that we were measuring the blood flow as the patient was cooled down to 22 degrees centigrade. And what we noticed was uh, the blood flow starts at a certain point when it's 37 degrees. And as we get down to 22, the blood flow to the brain drops, drops, drops. And what we found was that the blood flow to the brain at 22 degrees was probably one third of what it was at 37 degrees. And that's probably part of the problem is that we thought oh, we need to perfuse the brain at a litre per minute because that's what it gets at 37, not realising actually when you drop down to 22, it doesn't need all that blood. And so the immediate effect is that this machine has allowed us to aim for a blood flow of about two to 300 mils per minute. So definitely we are flowing much, much less than we would have dared to before. Um, so it's definitely bringing in science and it's bringing in data and it's allowing us to be patient specific. And so for you, Mark, what has been the most significant change in you doing what you do because of these robotics? And where do you see the future of these kinds of robotics and AI coming into place in the theatre? It really has transformed the way that we do our operations as a team because Previously, we also needed a vascular technician. So vascular technicians are very highly qualified people who you can't really expect them to come and sit in theatre the entire day and do repeated measurements. So this machine, it can be run by someone who's not vascular trained. It doesn't require sort of a master's level qualification in vascular physiology to be able to run the machine, which is another great benefit. I think the next step in terms of robots and artificial intelligence is to me like ultimately having all that data fed back to a perfusion pump so that it automatically regulates the blood flow. So it's not just the technician saying to me, well, the blood flow is a certain amount and me saying to the perfusionist, can you increase the blood flow to the brain through the pump? But that is automatically controlled by AI, and much more elegant in the way we protect the brain. And the, the most amazing thing about this is that you do this really extreme thing to them. And quite often you come in in the morning and they're sat in a chair having breakfast and you just think, gosh, like that is such a massive thing you've done to that patient. But the body is somehow so resilient that that patient wakes up the following morning and sat in a chair having breakfast. It's a constant amazement to me and I do it every week. Professor Mark Field there, giving us an insight into how a robotic system is improving the way patients are looked after while in an operating theatre during major surgery. What an insight we've had. There were ways that I thought robotics were being used in healthcare, but they're used in so many more ways than I thought and that are behind the scenes and things that just make total sense for us to delegate to autonomous beings to get those things out the way so the medical practitioners that are always overworked to get them to do the things that they need to do and free up their time so they can look after us the best way they can. And that is it for this week. A massive thank you to my guests, Robin Cardwell, Bill McKeon and Professor Mark Field. Next time, we're going to take you to a very hot place, a very high place and to the depths of the ocean as we'll be exploring the world of robotics working in extreme environments. I'm Fran Scott and the Robot Podcast is a fresh air production for ABB. The producers are Graham Seaman and Izzy Clark. And don't forget to follow now for free wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Part of the ABB Decoded series. 